Buenos días chicos, hoy os traigo algo un poquito diferente al canal, hoy os traigo a uno de mis youtubers favoritos con todo esto de la dieta carnívora que descubrí recientemente y uno de los responsables que yo esté siguiendo esta dieta. Él es, eh, bueno ahora vamos a, a, ir, a entrar un poco más en detalle en su, en, en su background, pero es básicamente un experto en nutrición, en fisiología y también en la ciencia del ejercicio. Les Barkey ha sido profesor en la universidad durante mucho tiempo, ha estado en academia, publicando, haciendo investigación. Así que es un placer tenerlo en el canal. Esta entrevista va a ser en inglés. He decidido hacer la introducción en castellano para que tengáis un poco de background. Eh, y nada, espero que os guste. Good morning, profesor. Pleasure to be here with you today. Sergey, gr um, gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, how, how, how is your, your, your level of Spanish? Oh, very, very poor. I can say, dos besos, por favor, la cuenta, por favor, gracias. Yes. Um, that's about it. The, the important yeah. stuff. Have you ever been, <laughs> have you ever been in Spain or South uh, America or places the, like that? The closest is yeah. I did some free and lead rock climbing one summer in Mallorca. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never been to, to to continental Spain. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I'm very interested. Well, I obviously know a little bit about your your background because you've mentioned that in in some videos. But I'm I'm very interested if you could share what your background is, what your experience is with regards to everything you've done in in, in the past, and especially why why is it that you did what what you did. Yeah. You get um, you get the short version of the story. Obviously, otherwise we'll be here all day. The short version is: I started my first undergraduate degree in the the physiology of rest and exercise. Actually, is what my first degree was: sports science, if you like, um, sport, yes. sport physiology. Mm -hmm. And I started that aged twenty seven, many many moons ago, um, having left school having done the final year of, of 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 secondary school education in New Zealand um i floated around after that i worked in service stations pumping petrol i did various laboring jobs um i played guitar and sang in rock bands in my evenings mm -hmm. um i was involved in theater Um, a little bit of dance, and um, I was also heavily involved in both um, weight training, competitive weightlifting of of various types, both some Olympic and and powerlifting. Um, and I was also quite heavily involved in martial arts of various different styles at various different levels, that kind of thing. And before I realized it, you know, I, I started doing that at 18, having left school at 18. And mm. before I realized what had happened, I was 27. I had no skills other than as a musician and as a fighter at the time and a weightlifter. Um, I had no hope of achieving my financial goals or any of those kind of things. It was like, well, where's your life going? So I decided to start yes. this degree and I thought the thing that made sense to me would be this, this sports science physiology field. So I got into that and that was my first degree. Um, fast forward X number of years and I finished the, the terminal research-based degree uh, in, in that field that was um, on offer at that time. And I started teaching pretty much straight away. In fact, I was actually teaching before I graduated. I was on the teaching staff as a teaching assistant, mm. yes. et cetera, before I, you know, I also had my first and second peer-reviewed publication um, before I had got my first undergraduate degree finished. Yes. And that's unheard of. Nobody does that. Mm. Um, yes. I stayed in academia in that field for about 10 years, teaching sport and exercise science, etc. I thought better of that 
at that stage, it started to annoy me and there were things being taught that I didn't agree with and I couldn't have an, the, um, the impact that I wanted to have. So I moved from there into human nutrition and I went through and did some advanced study in that field as well and then started teaching that as well as physiology and anatomy and biomechanics and all of that and statistics. Um, then the same thing rolled around. I got annoyed with the nutrition side of things precisely because of the misinformation, the, the outright lies basically that are taught to students learning nutrition science and the inability of academics, despite the fact that they are legally entitled to think for themselves, it's frowned upon. You get bullied, you get poo-pooed, you get denied progression, you know, all sorts of things go on because you're the one who's prepared to stand up and say, well, actually, no, this is not correct, etc. And then from human nutrition, in the last few years of my academic career before I resigned entirely and said, that's enough, I'm done with this, I actually taught what's called cardiovascular pathophysiology, which is a flash way of saying heart disease, atherosclerosis, that kind of stuff. Why does that happen? What is the underpinning cause of heart disease? That that kind of stuff, yeah. etc. And I ended up teaching that for a while. All along, I did a number of research projects as sole investigator, first author, etc. So I've got a, a long list of publications in various different fields connected with those areas and statistics, pure and applied as well. By the way, and both experimental works as well as review articles, book chapters in textbooks, etc. Um, got promoted right up to the top, the highest rank in academia, eventually by the end of it, um, which is a, an academic rank called professor, uh, which is just an indication of your standing in the field that you're teaching in, etc. Um, it doesn't denote any specific qualification, by the way. Yeah. Um, I do have three advanced research degrees, so fine, whatever, um, which is two more than most people, whatever. It's because I changed direction twice. <laughs> it, it doesn't mean I'm yes. brilliant. It just means I didn't apply myself to various fields because they annoyed me. Um, and that's a bit of a story of my life, really, um, in terms of that. End of 2018, academic year, I'd had enough. I was sick of it. Um, the pay is pretty crap anyway, frankly, in academia. <laughs> so I went, I'm going to go and do my own thing. I'm going to go and be a YouTube influencer. I'm going to consult with people privately and, and charge what I want to charge. And, um, and I also got involved in marketing a range of nutraceuticals, which are absolutely outstanding, brilliant, and indicated for all people. Everybody should buy them because they're great. And um, and that's what I do now. So there you go. Mm -hmm. mm. May I ask you what happened exactly that triggered your um, departing departure from from academia in, in two thousand eighteen? Yeah, it's Did not a secret. Something no, in particular yeah, happened. Yeah, absolutely, it's something we can talk about. It's not a secret at all. Um, basically, I was a rare sort of a creature in academia, in that. I questioned everything, including authority, firmly, very firmly. I was not prepared to be told, this is what you must say and this is what you cannot say to a group of students, because the whole point of academia is that there are enshrined in legislation in all the Western nations that have university study they all have a law or an equivalency of the law. It's called academic freedom is the colloquial term of the law. It's, that's not what the laws are called, but they're just referred to as academic freedom. What it is, is basically it says an academic, any academic, is free to hold and espouse any opinion they should see fit for any reason, be that popular or otherwise. That is very, very wide-reaching. That's very, very clear. It's very much like the First Amendment United States um, mm. thing that says a person is free to say whatever they want. Tee hee. Tee hee these days. <laughs> Are they, though? Anyway, um, legally, the wording is very clear, and it says an academic can say whatever he or she wants to say. 
whether it's popular or not, or even whether it's correct or not, actually. Hmm. I made sure that everything that came out of my mouth during my 25 years in academia was absolutely correct and unassailable scientifically, precisely because I have a personality whereby um, I, I feel compelled to make sure that everything that comes out of my mouth is correct and indicated before it comes out. I don't just say things and then hope it's right, basically. So mm. when I formed opinions about what the truth of something was, the way that something was scientifically underpinned or not, I was unshakable on those things. For instance, in nutrition studies, the curriculum document said saturated fat is bad for you and causes heart disease. And that's what I was expected to stand up in front of a group of students paying good money and say, well, sorry, no, I'm not going to stand up in front of a group of people mm. and say something like that because it is false. Saturated fat does not cause heart disease. Same deal with cholesterol. No, nope. does not cause heart disease. I'm not going to stand up and say something that is incorrect. I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm going to show them what the science is and what it isn't, what it can and cannot inform on, and the underpinnings of the scientific discipline that we use to determine cause and effect for this, that, or the other thing. In other words, I'm going to teach students the thing they actually need, and that is the ability to think for themselves and apply the disciplines of science appropriately, correctly, robustly, so that what they say has veracity, not so that they are correctly parroting and regurgitating what they are told to think. Mm which is very different, that gets under the bonnets, that puts a bee in the bonnets of people who want to um, really indoctrinate people rather than educate them. So I was a rare creature in the education industry in that I wanted to educate people appropriately. That yeah. was frowned upon. I was bullied. I was um, denied various advancements for the vast majority of my career that I should have got vastly sooner than I did end up getting, whether or not people want to believe I did or not. There are still people, by the way, running around claiming that I've made up my academic background, that I, it's, it's a fabrication of some kind, that I'm just pretending to be someone, that I'm just playing a character. I am to yes. some degree. I'm playing a bit of a character on, on my yeah. YouTube channel. I am being a certain way in order to garner views and clicks and, and create interest in what I have to say. But I'm still educating by subterfuge. I'm still actually saying, yes, and now that I've got your attention by using short words and and abusing others that are wrong on the interwebs, now that I've got your attention, here is some education for you. Here is some stuff you need to know about science, some unassailable, yes. correct stuff. Um, so that's why I'm doing that. When I say, you know, this is my name, this is my academic background. This is how many different universities I've worked in on four different continents over X number of years, and here is my academic ranking. I'm saying those things because they are a fact. Hmm. It's not even up for discussion. Somebody, you know, A lot of people say, well, prove it then. I'm not required to. If you want to yeah. offer me a job and you want to check my credentials, I'll happily provide them to you should I be applying to you for a job. Hmm. I'm not doing that. I'm educating people on the YouTubes. I don't owe you an explanation. Yes. And in fact, if I can keep my background out of the public eye a bit, it's a good way of not doxing yourself. And actually, it's a good way of keeping your powder dry so that when people think they know more than you do and are more qualified than you are that want to take you on, show up, you then show them that they've made a mistake publicly. And that's quite fun. Yes. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. most people are now aware of the fact that they really don't want to show up and try and debate me online on any topic because they will absolutely get wrecked. And as such, the number of people that are actually prepared to front me for a debate these days is close to zero. The only people that do want to do it are people who are actually so very limited, so very unintelligent that they actually think they have a chance. And they're people that yeah, it's not going to be a good debate. It's just going to be entertainment value, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yes. that's how that is. So that's what happened. Basically, I've never been someone who could be bullied. I've never been someone who could be browbeaten into doing something that I believe to be fundamentally wrong. So I said no, 
and I'm not going to do this for less than a hundred thousand dollars a year. Basically, exactly. uh, it, it's it's not worth yeah. it's not worth my health. I'm going to go and do my own thing. See you later. It's your loss. And actually, I think I've now been able to probably impact as many lives positively or close to it as I did in 25 years in academia. Yes. Well, yes, that's the power of the internet and yeah. these things. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. So something that comes to mind is how do you realize that you are being indoctrinated? Because the vast majority of people stay, stay in there forever. They're yeah. dietitians, nutrition, yeah. and, and all this. Yeah. The trick is that you have to be prepared to check everything that is said to you and follow every assertion in the literature, follow every rabbit hole to the bottom. And you have to have the skills, the experience and the knowledge of how to read a scientific paper or scientific communication of some kind in a manner that is appropriately critical and it gives you the ability to actually comment sensibly on the veracity of any given piece of so-called science. Because 99% of everything published is absolute rubbish. Complete rubbish. And the fact that a person can sit down with a scientific paper and read the words, look at the tables, what, how they pay tables appear, the pretty charts and things, and read mm. the words and read the conclusions written by the authors who want you to feel a certain way about what their paper says, the, the fact that you can read those words doesn't mean you are competent to read that paper and interpret it appropriately, competently, and critically. Yes. Most people are not. Most academic people can't read a paper competently. Yeah. And also many so-called experts they mm. they may be clinicians or something like that yeah. they they are not used to all all, all this research like um procedures yeah i mean they, sorry to interrupt think think about this science is litigated empirically that means with numbers mm -hmm. okay the role of a scientist is to plan a study that is appropriate and fits the scientific di discipline, i.e. that paper is capable of informing on the thing that the people want to conclude with regard to at the end. Mm. Then the scientist collects that data and puts that data in the paper, or a summary of that data, here's what the data was, here's what the results of this investigation were. Then what happens after that in the paper is there's a section called conclusion. And the authors say, this paper shows that. Mm. Why is that section necessary? If their job is to design a, a study that is capable of informing empirically on the question, making, providing some empirical evidence, some numbers, some proof of something, and they have appropriately executed that study, it being properly designed in the first place, here were the results and numbers, here are the charts and tables, should that not be the end of the paper? Why do we need a comment from the authors about what the numbers say? We can read the numbers for ourselves, those of us who yeah, are so competent to read numbers. That section, conclusions, that's where science has lost its way. That's where we get to indoctrinate you. We get to say, I'm the scientist, you're the mere reader, I'm telling you what my numbers show because you couldn't possibly understand my numbers if you wanted to. My mm. numbers are far too intelligent for you. Just read this conclusion here that tells you what my numbers say. And by the way, maybe I'll tell you who my funding sources were who informed me on what to say in my conclusion, if you're lucky. Are, are people obliged to disclose any interest on their papers? These days, most decent journals will require a statement of conflict of mm. interest. But they won't then turn around and read that conflict of interest, that, that journal author, and then, and then on the basis of that, turn around and say to a given author, I'm not publishing your work. You are completely disqualified from commenting 
on this topic on the basis of your demonstrated conflict of interest right here that you've just admitted to. Hmm. The, the, the worst example of that I have ever seen is in a paper that is always cited by people antithetical to myself, those who are members, card-carrying members of the Church of Anorexia Vegana, for example, who rely entirely on an assertion that saturated fat uh, or cholesterol or some aspect of saturated fat and cholesterol collectively are involved causally in yes. heart disease um, because they need to divert attention away from the destitution of their diet nutrition-wise and the fact that it destroys people's health, and they need to cast dispersions on a different diet to suggest that theirs is the answer somehow when it's not. Anyway, that's for another day. There's a paper by a, a group of scientists who decided for themselves that they would call themselves collectively the European Consensus Panel on Cardiovascular Disease. There is no such panel put together by any government industry you know, formed board. Yes. And even if they were government funded, that doesn't mean they're not compromised because they are still. But these are yeah. a group of individuals, you know, just, just um, academics working in various different universities around Europe and elsewhere, actually, who said, oh, let's call ourselves the European Consensus Panel on Cardiovascular Disease. So they did that. And they wrote this paper, which they entitled uh, Low Density Lipoprotein Cholesterol Causes Atherosclerosis, or something very similar to that, in big text. And much smaller text just above that in the top right-hand corner, it said, opinion piece, which they don't point to. They just have big letters, LDL cholesterol causes heart disease. And then they run through a bunch of associative data sets, which they purport prove absolutely this cause and effect relationship when no associative data set can actually inform on cause and effect. It is impossible. It cannot be done. That is anti-science false, yes. whatever. And then at the end of their paper, it says conflict of interest, and there are like three and a half full page columns <laughs> listing the multiple authors of this paper and every pharmaceutical company, et cetera, that has paid them millions and millions of dollars to come and give us a talk about cholesterol or whatever, or yes. here is a kickback for prescribing statin medications to lower your cholesterol, the thing that they're claiming causes heart disease. I wonder why. And that thing got published. I have never seen a more obvious, bought and paid for piece of propaganda work yes. in my life. Yes. And there are yes. still imbeciles who want to cite that thing either at the general yeah. public or whoever is listening to any debate or at me and say, here, look, here's proof. What are you talking about? I'm like, yeah. where yeah, do I even done. start yeah. with this? I could start. In fact, I have done. I've, I've spent many hours debunking that paper um, yeah. scientifically from, from start to finish. And yes. it's like war I, if a duck's I, back. I, the next week they're <laughs> citing that same paper again, saying, look, here's proof. Uh, yeah, and they do relentlessly, yeah. and it, it 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 never ends. Yeah. I, I'm thinking because I know what what paper you are you are talking about. For anyone interested in knowing, how do you tell these people that what they are saying is not true? I'll I will link your video on that. Cool. Because it was it was really eye opening for me. Mm. Um, You're welcome to check that. I think I think it's, it's a good exercise. Cool. That people can do, especially for those who like to think critically. Um, because, well, it's like, am I going to die of heart, of heart disease if I eat butter? No. You're and not. then, and then the answer is no, but if you're not co convinced, this is the strongest evidence that we, we unfortunately need to debunk. It, it shouldn't be like that because they would they would still need to be required to come up with something that it actually proves. Mm. Not the other way around, mm. but it sometimes is yeah. is like that. Yeah, look, that, in, that, that in, was really good. In any debate, the person making the positive claim, this causes that, they are the person responsible for proving it. Proof of cause and effect can only, only be provided via a properly designed, properly randomized, properly powered 
properly tenured metabolic ward lock in study, which is experimental, where all other factors are controlled. And if you want to um, extrapolate to outcomes, hard health outcomes over multiple decades, then you need to keep those people under lock and key in that lab under observation for multiple decades. You cannot establish cause and effect, which is the claim being made, using an association. No matter how good that association, and the association they've got is poor, it's weak, actually, yes. at best. There are many indicators that it's not present at all, even statistically, this association. Um, but even if it was a strong association, which it is not, that cannot establish cause and effect. I mean, here's an example. I can tell you what else is, is associated with what else, if you like. If you do a study which correlates, associates the cases of sunburn at a beach resort on any given day, over a number of days, X number this day, X number that day, X number the day after, whatever for hmm. the entire summer season, Okay, and you also record how many ice creams were sold at that beach resort on that day, you're going to find a strong, positive, predictable correlation between the sale of ice creams and the incidence of sunburn, aren't you? Of course you are. So, the answer, the way to solve the problem of sunburn, what we need to do is shut down those jolly ice cream salesmen. They're the yeah. problem. Yeah. That's what you've got exactly. here with this co with this yeah. so-called cholesterol heart disease so-called correlation. It's ridiculous. We are done on that. Yes. That's how you I mean you can watch my video absolutely and it gets into the nuance and there is a lot of nuance, yes, but if mm. you want the absolute slam dunk, there it is. I've just given it to you. Mm -hmm. It's a yes. ice cream sales and sunburn. Here's another one just for fun, just to just to add to it. There is a powerful, strong correlation between drownings in swimming pools and the release of movies starring Nicolas Cage. Mm. Should we ban movies starring Nicolas Cage? I think we should. Mm. But not because that will have any effect on drownings in swimming pools. Okay. Mm -hmm. Done. <sighs> All right, one yeah. more, one more. Every single time you see footage on television of a serious forest fire, every time you will see shots of firemen running around with hoses. Ergo, to deal with the scourge of forest fires, we need to disband these jolly firefighting brigades, don't we? Yeah, exactly. They're the problem. <laughs> okay, now I'm really done. Yes. Finished. Yeah. Yes. One, one other point I think it's very important here. Like, people know that Correlation doesn't imply causation. They know that but they don't really use that because we obviously are still the two, which is that um, you can dismiss causation if you don't find even an association. Yeah. Which means that if you can find a meta analysis, say, of LDL and heart disease that doesn't even show an association. Mm -hmm. And those usually don't have any conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and you can dismiss that. Yeah. So correlation cannot establish causality, but lack of correlation okay. can dismiss yes. it. Because yes. if it was cause and effect, it would show up strongly. Yes. And it would show up always and, and with no doubt and, yes. and as strong as, yes. as that. Um, yeah. And the fact is, is, it doesn't in the case of cholesterol and heart disease. Done. Yes. yes, sadly we are still talking about this. I think I think that they are going to try more and do more studies on that. And I think it's getting I made a post on Twitter about that. The story is getting more sophisticated because they they keep thinking that it's not good enough to keep um convincing people that that is true. And so now it's APOB. Mm -hmm. It used to be LDL. Mm -hmm. Now it's APOB. Mm -hmm. And at some point it's going to be 
LPA or any other market that that, 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 yeah. that they can find. So yeah. unfortunately, I don't think this is over yet. No, but uh, we'll be here <laughs> yeah. to dismiss that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move to diet now. Um, I would like to know first how is your current diet, and why in the first place you you decided to do keto back back in the in the day and also yep. carnivore. Yeah. Okay. So I started keto twenty seven years ago. Um, because that was one of the time frames at which keto had a resurgence. It was in vogue before that and went out. Um, I, I got on the bandwagon at that time about 27 years ago and it drifted out of vogue again after that. I stayed on it pretty much. Mm -hmm. And again, it's drifted in and out several times since. It's something that comes around periodically. Keto is a craze that, yeah. that, keeps, that keeps coming back. Um, I was also of a mindset to be supportive of whatever was in the mon minority and that most people weren't in agreement with. That was, I was hardwired in me to, to be attracted to that. But I checked it out because I check out everything. I checked it out thoroughly, exactly. very, very thoroughly. And I was absolutely convinced that keto was a good idea for a number of reasons. So I jumped on board and I got quite a bit of benefit out of it over a number of years. Um, I never went keto, uh, not keto, I never went carnival until about eight and a half years ago, purely because I'd never heard of such a thing, because no one was doing that that I was aware of or talking about that until about that time. Yes. Somebody said, well, this keto thing makes sense to you. What, what, why wouldn't you go fully carnival? And of course I said all the usual things. Well, don't you need some of the things that are in plants? Isn't some kind of balance a good idea? Um, you know, shouldn't I have at least some fiber? All of those things that people always say. I still had those ideas. And the person that suggested it to me said, Well, it, you know, I've checked it out. And it was someone I respected um, mm -hmm. as having, you know, a good knowledge base and a good scientific mind. And, and that person said to me, You know, I know you like to check things out. Why don't you check it out for yourself? Don't believe me. Check it out for yourself. So I did. Exactly. And yes. I went, Well, actually, this does make sense. I'm going to do that to prove that it makes sense and to be contrarian really um so i did and uh, you know i don't regret it i started out at around about 85 percent carnival for the first few years mm -hmm. then i went sort of 90 then i went 95 and more recently i've been 100 percent plus or minus sometimes i drift back to 95 for a few weeks and like oh this is crazy because it yes. really does make a difference and then i get back to the mm -hmm. 100 and get back to full health again and go geez why did i go 95 other than because i'm a human being and a hedonist and you know whatever <laughs> and so i'm drifting 95 100 95 100 95 100 that's what i do now pretty much all the time yeah so mm -hmm. that was it in a nutshell yes i'm pretty much i would say i'm pretty 90, between 95 and 100, say 98. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's, it's not a big difference. I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I don't have any less people struggling with epilepsy or mental disorders, mm -hmm. or there's other people with autoimmune issues. Yeah. I'm lacking that regard because I didn't, I don't have any of that yeah. if I eat all that. But I saw myself becoming an old man. Um, I'm not even 30 now, so how, how can I say that? Well, coming from, from the, my, my 20s, that you think that you are going to be young forever. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it doesn't seem to, to be true anymore. And if you don't change anything about that, then you know where it leads. Yeah. Obesity, disease, diabetes, cancer, you name it. Yeah. So I gave it a try. I did it wrong for many years. That's why I'm, I'm spreading the word now. Um, there's things that need to be taken into consideration and it's also important because if you do it wrong then you go online and complain about that and then you you, you create a bad anecdote mm -hmm. that doesn't help yeah say uh keto keto flu keto rash mm -hmm. oxalate dumping these yeah. these things yeah so what i in my case i would quit carbs too fast and then i would have the keto flu and and i just felt dizzy and i got tested and and, and i didn't know what was wrong and it, it it got fixed when i went back to eating cake let's say so for years I was trying that because I just saw online sugar is bad. 
But when people meant sugar, they meant table sugar. Mm-hmm. Like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but, but, but then I thought, why is it bad? And to what extent the other kinds of sugars are bad? Sweeteners, fructose, and these things. So then I found low carb, and then I started doing it, but I did it wrong. Because you, you can do it wrong yeah. if, if you do it too fast. Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't until I found your content and Dr. Chafee's content that I, I thought, well, let's give it a try. That was a carnivore because I was doing low carb, well done out of, um, well, let's just reduce some carbs slowly and see and see if it helps. And it did. And I was low carb and keto and now carnivore. And for me, what made the switch is something you said, this concept about species appropriate diet. Because if I see carnivore, then I'm like, well, why carnivore and not vegan? Or any other mm. any other diet because in my eyes it, it, it was another fat diet so what wh- why not do vegan like i need a stronger reason than than that other than well i like meat and so when you said species of appropriate diet then it suddenly made sense that well every animal has a species appropriate diet if they don't follow that diet they eventually get sick so carnivore helps people insofar it's our species appropriate diet because on paper, if you tell people, I only eat ribeyes and I feel best uh, on that. And I'm, I don't know, 50 something. Mm-hmm. Like, I am off medications. I don't have any symptoms. I am better in this and that. It really sounds like a snake oily um, sales speech. It's like, what's going on here? It, it almost seems like a, like a miracle. but when you make the switch about, well, no, this is how you're supposed to eat. So you shouldn't have, you should feel all right. People don't feel all right. And they think that's what's, what's normal. So when I made that switch, then, then I went full, full carnivore and, and I don't regret it one bit. And it's also surprisingly easy to stick with, um, contrary to, to what many people say. And I wanted to ask you if someone suspects they might do um a lot better than how they are doing now but they don't they're trying it they don't they're using um going low carb keto a carnivore because well you know cholesterol these things mm-hmm. what would you tell someone that fears going there even when they know when they know about all the potential benefits right Fear is an interesting emotion, and it can paralyze a person. Absolutely. I understand that. I think you've actually hit the nail on the head yourself earlier when you quite correctly suggested that a person who refuses to change direction will end up where they're headed. There's no two ways about that. It's not a risk. It's not a um, a likelihood. It's not you know any of those things. It's a it's a definite outcome. You will end up you will end up where you're headed. And and, and if that's not somewhere you want to end up, you need to change direction. Hmm. You need to listen to people like myself who have checked this out very very fully with a competent faculty of scientific reasoning who can interpret what is and what is not evidence of this, that, or the other thing, and who is able, within seconds, to point directly to someone's conflict of interest that would lead them to lie to you. Hmm. So when I say that the 100% carnivorous diet is species-appropriate and species-specific, there is no guesswork involved in that at all. None. Yes. If you want science about human nutrition, the last place you should look is in the area of science, the ring-fenced area of ideology known as human nutrition science. There is no science being done in that field. Science is experimental works, properly designed, properly controlled, etc., etc., like I was talking about before, properly Mm -hmm. powered, properly tenured, etc., using genetically identical sets of twins separated at birth, put in labs and locked in there, every aspect of their lives controlled except for the one thing that you want to make a cause and effect statement about. 
failing that, you're not doing science. You're doing ideology. You're doing propaganda. Mm. Okay. What we need is hard science to inform us that human beings ought to eat meat and fat and not plants. So where do I get that from? There's no science being done. So what am I talking about? Well, here it is. Mm. Actual scientists doing actual science with actually scientifically verifiable experimental procedures have been able to extract collagen, which is a protein, from the long bones of human skeletal remains found all over the planet of all ages, up to over 100,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Collagen is very stable, it lasts a long time, and in it there are nitrogen uh, atoms in the collagen. Nitrogen is a stable isotope, it doesn't radioactively degrade in the way that carbon does. Ergo, we can use carbon to date the bones. We know exactly how old these bones are using carbon. We can use nitrogen, a stable isotope, isotope to tell us exactly how much protein they got from animal sources versus how much protein they got from plant sources. Ergo, we can reconstruct the macronutrient makeup of the diet of human beings going right back to over 100,000 years ago, unequivocally, absolutely slam dunk using actual science. Mm. We know what people did definitely eat, absolutely without question. To that, we add our knowledge of Darwinian positive and negative selection pressures, genetic drift. This is how genes are informed. This is how our organ systems are informed. This is how our biological system is yes. built. These are our, these are our um, metabolic pathways that are in existence. All of that stuff points in exactly the same direction, and it tells us that human beings are absolutely biologically designed to live off animal muscle meat, muscle meat, not organs, and associated fat. Salt is fine and helpful. Butter, quite good for extra fat. Water as your beverage, pretty much. Rinse and repeat. That is how we live for well, it, the inference beyond what we can establish absolutely in terms of the testing of collagen, the inference is that this pattern of eating actually extends back about four and a half million years. Even, yeah. if, even if they're wrong about that, because that's not absolute proof, what is absolutely proved is that it's well over 100,000 years that we ate that way. We stopped doing that about 10,000 years ago when some smart cookie said, oh, look, the planet's thawing. Plants are growing all over the place. The woolly mammoth are all gone because we've eaten them all. Uh, what are we going to do? Mm, let's grow some grasses and eat their seeds instead. Yes. See how that and goes. Shrink through. our brains. Shrink our brains, shrink our skeletal yeah. structures, make them more weak and less robust, make us lose muscle mass. We, we got shorter. We got dumber. And and the slide of our intelligence continues to this day. Did you did you know that the average intelligence of a human being is now less than it was even ten years ago? Ten years. Yeah, even over the last ten oh. years. Ten years ago, the average IQ, a, a gauge of intelligence, was one hundred. Yes. So if your IQ was as low as one hundred, half the people in the world were dumber than that. Incredible mm -hmm. to think about, really, but that's what, how it was. Today, the average IQ is 85. Yeah. Wow. You can't, yeah. like, if you do an IQ test and you come in under 80 in the military, they'll turn you around. You are too yeah. dumb yeah. to be in the military as, as a grunt. Yes. The average IQ is now 85. Anyway, that's for another day. Yes. Um, 
I've got another question, maybe more related to the psychology of all this. Mm -hmm. I got into this and I suddenly realized, well, we are not destined to suffer miserably from horrible diseases. Mm -hmm. um, now I would like to spread the word. I would like that my people, friends and relatives that are suffering from various things would give this a try. What is in your experience, the best approach, how would you tell people, um, look, this is going to help you because yeah. they suddenly think that, 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 that you're crazy and that you are the one that are putting your, your, your health at, at risk. Yeah. What is the psychology of, I would like you to do this, but I don't want it to sound that I'm, I'm, I'm selling you anything or that I'm suddenly, I suddenly belong to a cult. Yeah. Okay. Because so... we, we generally want them to be better. Yeah. How do you tell them? All right. There are two categories, really, if you want to categorize, or it's a, a, a continuum, if you like, fine. But let's say there were two categories. People about whose welfare you have some vested interest and care about, a small group of people probably around you, and people at large who sure as a good person you would like ideally to be healthy and not suffer these diseases that are unnecessary that we all, yes. most of us do suffer, et cetera. Okay. But about whom actually at the end of the day, it's their life. You don't really care. It's not going to change your life. You just would like to maybe help them change theirs. Yes. People that are nearest and dearest to you, sadly, it seems to me are the people who are, you are actually least likely to be able to influence meaningfully. Yes. They will resist you more than people about whom you have this general um, feeling that, you know, this, we, are, we, are, we have shared humanity. I care about you as a human being. I'd like you not to necessarily suffer and die before your time. I'd like you to know the truth. Those people are actually more likely to listen than nearest and dearest relatives and close friends, actually. That's a sad fact. I, I don't know the answer to that for you. This, the group of people that are the people at large, humanity at large, all you can do is two things, really. Speak the truth and be the best example that you can be. The longer that you apply 100% carnivore, the better your apparent health will be with respect to what it would have been had you not done that, yes. all else being equal. At some point, people will notice that you are thriving rather than just surviving. You are not obese. You are not inflamed to the gunnels every day of your life. You don't have heart disease. You don't get diabetic. You don't put on more and more and more weight every year. You maintain a reasonable amount of muscle mass. I'm working on it. I've been sedentary for a few years and it's got to the point where I'm like, no, that stops now. Let's, let's get back to the weights. Um, and you just continue to tell the truth. And the truth is almost every disease you can possibly name that human beings typically suffer at some point in their life, almost every one of those diseases is causally underpinned absolutely by chronic systemic inflammation in some way. Examples of things that absolutely are inflammatory diseases, slam dunk, no question, absolutely. Heart disease, okay, it's a disease of inflammation. It's not a disease of lipids at all mm -hmm. or any aspect of lipids. It's nothing to do with lipids. It's, infla it's inflammatory in, in its causation. Um, type 2 diabetes, same deal. Type 1 diabetes, usually an autoimmune dysfunction, usually caused in the first instance by an inflammatory process. Um, most dementias, most forms of cancer, all the big killers, the things that will kill a person, yes. all inflammatory. Would you include their um, cases of Parkinson's disease? Yes. And um, ALS, yes. things like that. Yes, mm. absolutely. 
pretty much yeah. a, almost any digestive disorder, inflammatory, autoimmune, etc. What is the single biggest cause of inflammation in humans? It is a diet which is inappropriate for your speciation. It is material, so-called food, being shoveled down your neck every day of your life that comes from the plant kingdom. Plants are not food for human beings. Mm. They are toxic, pro-inflammatory, gut-destroying, um, immune system aggravating, poisonous, non-food slop. You should not eat plants. That's the single biggest thing you can do to reduce your inflammatory load immediately. Mm. Now I say that, caveat that, don't change your diet suddenly, vastly, overnight. Get to a 100% carnivore diet over the next six to eight weeks, slowly remove the plant material that's in your diet now. Don't drop it all out overnight. That will cause you a problem. I'll explain that another day if you need me to. Otherwise, we'll be here all night. Yes. I've suffered from that myself. So yeah. I see many people saying, well, I'm suddenly going to go carnivore for one month. Mm. It's like, yeah, maybe you won't like that. Mm. So so best to avoid. Um, one last question. Yep. Um, in your mind, yes. when you are with your arguments, um, in favor of a carnivore diet, keto diet, and all this. Mm -hmm. What is the conversation you've had with, with yourself with regards to, if you are to play devil's advocate, yep. what is the best argument you think there is against all this? Right. I have searched high and low. I have tried very, very hard to find it, whatever an argument might be against a carnivore diet. Why did I try and find a reason why it's no good? Because one of the first things I learned in terms of the faculty of competent scientific thinking is that I understand my responsibility as a scientist. First and foremost, my responsibility as a scientist is to disprove myself. I must do everything I can within reasonable conduct to find a way to prove myself wrong. If I don't mm. do that, I am not behaving as a scientist. I'm behaving as yes. a propagandist, as a, as a theologist, as a, as a faith-based practitioner. So I have hunted high and low for a single argument that will hold any water even for a second that suggests to me that I should do anything other and eat the muscle meat and associated fat of large ruminant animals mostly and eat once a day and eat a, a, a certain amount of that protein material in terms of the meat and make up the rest of the diet with associated fats that are largely animal fats, well, entirely animal fats, but largely saturated animal fats. Mm -hmm. And the more saturated, the better so long as they are animal fats. Yes. Drink water for my beverage and add salt to taste to, to what I eat to keep my electrolytes as they should be. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is appropriate. That is the most health-promoting, the most species-appropriate diet for a human being, all human beings. Um. The only caveat to that is that there are some people who have damaged their metabolism and their health so badly in their previous standard Western diet, plant eating, um, omnivorous or even worse vegetarian or vegan lifestyle that they've had previously. Mm -hmm. Some people are so damaged that we can't put them onto a full carnivore diet without a much more protracted program of repairing their system. Some of those people do need to keep some carbohydrates in their diet, a very small amount, mind. But mm -hmm. all things being equal, a person who has not hugely badly damaged their metabolism 
should absolutely, starting today, move towards a fully carnivorous diet, which they will get to about eight weeks from now. No question. No argument against it. There is nothing that I have found that exists that convinces me, it convinces me in any way that there's any doubt that that is what a person should do, absolutely, mm. without any questions. Yes. None. I've asked you that question because I was dealing with a question I had in my mind. Why 100% and not say, for instance, 70 30? Mm -hmm. Because the N15 data usually points to 70 80%. Yep. So that's the question about, well, what about the other 20%, yeah. 30%? Yeah. And then I was thinking about that and it's like, well, if you take a look at that 30% and let's assume it's plants, mm -hmm. why is that better than eating, say, steak and eggs? Right. It's not. It's not. So, so it, it, it just isn't. Yeah. So I don't even need to, to invoke any, um, uh, studies on fiber, the, the famous Paul, Paul Mason study, but, mm -hmm. but we've got that if we need more, yeah. more about that. Yeah. So then there's the, the question, okay, why didn't they eat 100%? And then the answer is, well, they couldn't, mm -hmm. but, but we can. So yeah. their environment is one of, of scarcity yeah. and ours is one of, of abundance. Yes. So still that 20 or 30% is not, yeah. it is not warranted. Yeah, that, that 20, 30% plant material that humans ate in um, antiquity was made up almost entirely from the fibrous roots of tuber-like things, not like potatoes and sweet potatoes and things like that that we have today that we've selectively bred to be much bigger, much starchier, less fibrous than they were originally. We're talking spindly root type things, almost entirely fiber, which we were able to ferment a small amount of in our guts and get some short chain, 100% saturated, as it turns out, fatty acids from having done that. Yeah. There was no starch. There was no sugar to speak of. Um, we got any sugar at all in the form of a few berries about two weeks a year. There were no aeroplanes, trains, automobiles, boats. There was no trucking of plant-based slop around the world for food at that stage. We subsisted on what was available. And if we were not successful for any reason in finding a woolly mammoth or some other animal to take down and eat, then the mammoth will dig up these roots and boil those up and boil yes. those up and boil those up until they break down into stringy fibers and then we'll chew on those, chew on those, chew on those and swallow those and hope that we can subsist long enough to survive until we can find a mammoth to eat again. Yes. We don't have to do that now. Exactly. We are able to go down the supermarket and buy meat. Well, they're working against that, aren't they, the powers that be? But at the moment, we can go down the supermarket and buy meat. Yes, for now. Yeah. For now. And if that, okay. ever, if that ever ceases and they ever stop us going to the supermarket to buy meat, I'll be the first one out there hunting. Yes. <laughs> With your spear. With my yes. spear. Okay. Yeah. Um, where can people find you? Okay, I'm Professor. easy, easy to find. Very, very easy. If you go to YouTube, which is where most of my um, focus is in terms of my social media influencing, and you type in at Bart, B-A-R-T hyphen K-A-Y, that will take you to my main YouTube channel. I have four or five other YouTube channels on various topics, which you may or may not find interesting, amusing, or whatever. Mm -hmm. All of those channels are linked under every video on my main channel, so you can find all those channels from there. Mm -hmm. I have an Instagram account, which is Bart underscore K underscore nutrition. That's pretty easy to find. I have a Twitter account, which is largely for my own entertainment and amusement, wherein I swear at people and call them <laughs> all sorts of imbecile and whatever for saying you should eat plants yes. and all that kind of stuff. Just, uh, that's just my release valve for, I guess, a bit of fun and it also just drives a bit of attention. Um, mm -hmm. Don't take it too seriously. Or do, I don't care. It's no skin off my nose. I've got a Facebook page. If you'd like to go to that, it's uh, Bart K 
Nutrition Science. Um, mm -hmm. You can find that there on the face pages. Or if you don't go to any of those places, if you go to the search engine of choice that you use on a daily basis, be that the one that starts with G or another one, others are available for balance, and you type mm -hmm. in my name, B-A-R-T space K-A-Y, the first 10 or 15 pages of returns that come out of that will be me. You'll find me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Cool. Thank you for being with us. My absolute pleasure. It was a privilege to share with you and to cross-pollinate and share the word still further. And yes, Spanish people, subscribe to all my channels. I'd love to have a larger Spanish audience. Gracias. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, one question about the the green green stuff. Yep. Because if you share with me the video, yep. then you need to put that thing on yes. first, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Let's talk about the green okay. stuff. I'm still recording, so we can just edit or even just leave it on at the end. That's great. Uh, the green stuff is the um, the nutraceutical supplement product that I was referring to earlier that I believe everybody should get involved with and, and get on mm -hmm. straight away. Yes. What is it? It is a naturally occurring um, adult stem cell promoting chemical it's actually derived it's extracted from a blue green cyanobacter that lives in this one lake in the u.s um and it's filtered up because you can't just dry cyanobacter and feed it to people because it's toxic and full of heavy metals and all sorts of nonsense so we've got a or the company it's not we i'm just joint ventured with the company they have a proprietary system of filtration that gets all the toxins and things out of it so that it's safe and clean and good for human consumption. And they mm -hmm. also have a patented proprietary process by which they activate the, the ingredient that they extract so that it actually works. There are a bunch of other companies on the coattails of this company that are selling dried whole bacteria out of the lake. Doesn't work and it's toxic. You need this product from this company. We're the only company with the, with the process to make it work, basically. Um, what does it do? It causes your bone marrow to release your adult stem cells into circulation, after which those adult stem cells will do magics in your body. They replace tissues in your body which are worn, diseased, aged, broken down, dysfunctional for whatever reason pretty much. When these, these stem cells detect a tissue that isn't functioning optimally well, whatever, they bind to it and differentiate into a new cell and replace the old one and dissolve the old one and it's out of here, basically. Absolutely magic, powerful, powerful stuff. Um, absolutely everybody should take this product daily for that reason. It's obvious. Um, and what I'll do is put a link up on the screen right now where people can go straight away and purchase it from sergey mm -hmm. actually you don't have to purchase it from wonderful me. get it from sergey yeah exactly there you go. so that's that's oh. our flagship product there are several other products the company also um, markets which are synergistic to the main stem enhance product they are an anti-inflammatory a blood flow optimizer and a collagen peptide supplement, which all synergize powerfully to really give you the best opportunity for the uh, for your natural renewal and repair system of your body to work to its best degree and sort out any percolating health issues that might be going on in your body that you may or may not even be aware of. Um, get onto it seriously; it's it's brilliant stuff. Um, I can't recommend it. Highly enough, I've used it myself for over 13 years. It's made yes. a massive difference to my own health and my own life. I wouldn't be without it, even if I wasn't joint ventured with the company, even if I wasn't going to earn a few dollars, literally, per customer who goes to Sergey's link and buys this product and supports what Sergey's doing in marketing this product. Um, so there you go. Everybody should be on it and, you know, get into it. Um, that said, 
If earning money is more interesting to you than spending it, drop Sergey an email, and I'm sure he'll put his email or contact details in the show notes under this video as well, and he will tell you the means by which you too can be involved in helping us to market this product to end consumers and get paid for it rather than being a customer. If you want to be a customer, that's great. We'll have you. You bet. We'll you love you. Ball. We'll love you. But if you want to earn some yeah. money, all I'm saying is there are opportunities available uh, on a case-by-case basis. So give give Sergey an email and he'll tell you about it. There you go. Mm-hmm. For how much time should someone um, try that until they see benefits? I always tell people that you need to commit in the first instance to six months at least before you even reassess whether it's doing you any good or not. This stuff is absolutely magic, but it's not a magic silver bullet that's going to work overnight. It takes time for your body to repair itself. Yes. You know, um, you need to give this thing a proper, a proper opportunity. And and I believe that six months is what you should do. Um, Mm. That's what I tell people. That said, we don't make any therapeutic claims at all. We don't promise you anything because we're not allowed to. It's an American company that follows FDA rules, and the FDA has decreed that we can't make any kind of therapeutic claim other than we are allowed to say what we can show scientifically cause and effect with experiments, and that is that this stuff does exactly what it says it does. It will cause your bone marrow to release your adult stem cells, more so than it would have done otherwise, significantly more so. Yes. And we do know that that's a good thing. Absolutely, there's no question. And if people are not happy, I think they offer a money back sure. and guarantee, which, course, is, which yep. is always course. Yeah, we stand. But, the company stands behind the product, absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great thing to have. Um, but people need to understand that even with, with your diet or, or, or with this kind of, of, of supplement, it takes time. Yes. So some changes can happen in, in, in a few weeks, but mm-hmm. some others won't happen in, in a few years. Sure. People suddenly say, well, okay, now, now I'm sold. When can I reap the, the benefits? And then some take time, unfortunately. Yeah. So, well, here's, so we here's, something that I, here's something that I can promise you, based on what we understand scientifically, that you can benefit from immediately using this product. Here it is. Every uh, single chromosome in the genes, in the nucleus of every single cell in your body, these chromosomes, they all have these ends that are like the thing on the end of a shoelace uh, that stops the shoelace from fraying. When you're born, your cells have telomeres of a given length. It's several thousand base pairs. Then what cells do normally, once they've differentiated into an adult cell line, a heart cell, a skin cell, a toenail cell, an eyeball cell, whatever, not hair cells, clearly, whatever, these cells, these adult cells will divide and divide and divide X number of times depending on what tissue it is. Every time those cells divide, that shoelace thing, that telomere, gets a little bit shorter. When it gets to a certain critical short length, that cell line stops dividing. It stops renewing itself, in other words, which means that cell line will die off. It's one of the reasons that our tissues age, become decrepit, and we die at the end of our lives. It's a biological clock. It tells our cell lines how many times they've divided and replaced worn out cells without the help of an adult stem cell input. When the stem enhanced product releases an adult stem cell from your bone marrow and it enters your bloodstream, that adult stem cell has full length telomeres because adult stem cells are an immortal cell line that have an enzyme called telomerase, which rebuilds the telomere length every time the stem cell divides in your bone marrow. You will die with the same number of adult stem cells that you were born with. 
unless you get heavily radiated and that kills your bone marrow. Yes. With, with, yeah. Okay. Um, so you can never run out of stem cells. But what happens as you age is your ability to release adult stem cells drops. It's part of the biological design. You're supposed to age and die to make room for a new generation of human beings. That's, that's the way it is. What we're doing with this product, though, is we're encouraging adult stem cells, m- many more of them, to migrate into your blood and to bind with aged tissues and replace those aged tissues with new cells. Those new cells have full-length telomeres. Biological age of the new tissue? Like an important. Now, Well, exactly. Now, I am not saying this product is a fountain of youth because I'm not allowed to say that. But if you understand what I just said about telomeres and adult stem cells, what you will do is go immediately to Sergey's link, which is still up on the screen, and you will do one of two things. You will go, I want to buy this product as a retail customer, and you'll do that. Or you will decide to join us as an affiliate to the marketing process in your own right, as an independent business owner with the right to do exactly what Sergey and I are doing, which is to market this product to end consumers by whatever means, so long as you play within the rules. And you'll do that. If you didn't understand what I just said, you might do neither of those things. But I suspect you probably got it. Yeah? Yeah. All right, that's the whole pitch on Sorol, really. It is that powerful. It is that important. You need to be involved yesterday. Um, yes. Anyway, thanks again yes. for the opportunity to talk to your people, Sergey, today. I appreciate that. Um, I My hope pleasure. that you got something out of it. Um, it, was, it was a great talk, I thought. Stick around. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure there'll be more great stuff on Sergey's channel coming up. What are, you, what are you planning next? What are the next videos that's happening on your channel? Um, my channel, it started as a way of, of, um, sharing partly my journey and also partly the reasoning and the dialogue, internal dialogue that I had with myself on why to do this, how to do this. And cause I, cause I wasn't about to do it if I wasn't fully convinced. So I'm just, my channel is about a uh, short format videos um, where I outline in each of them ideas that hopefully can help people understand why this thing works, how to do it, and what they should worry about, what they shouldn't worry about. And in a way that's digestible, quick and clean, so people can say, hmm, well, okay, what about vitamin C, I don't know. Then I've got a video where I talk about that. What about cholesterol? This. Nice. Why does it work? Well, here it is. Awesome. And these are all questions that I was asking my, myself before actually doing it. So I am talking really to someone with interest in this, uh, in doing this for, for their own health and hopefully guiding them through the process that I went through uh, before actually doing it. Awesome. And also, uh, well, I engage with the uh, people that leave comments and say, well, this happened to me, or what about this? Then I might do a video on that. Um, because it really is useful to get feedback and see and see what people, what troubles people. Mm. Awesome. So that's the idea. Sounds great. We'll look forward to that. And uh, yeah, again, thank you for your time today, and uh, I'll let you get on with it. Cheers. Thank you, Professor. Okay.